welcome to St. Stephen's Church Online. It's great to have you here worshipping with us. My name is Nisha and on behalf of the rest of the staff team, you are so welcome. Before we come to our opening song of worship, there are a couple of updates happening in the life of church. Holiday Club. This year's theme is The Greatest Story and it will be running between the 4th and the 6th of April. There will be games, crafts, Bible teaching, sports and so much more. Don't forget to sign up via our website. Focus is back and we're so excited to be able to gather together as a church family to worship, learn and have fun. Next Sunday is our last day to get the discounted rate and we don't want anyone to miss out so please sign up via our website. Our talk today was recorded at last Sunday's service. Bishop Emma kicked off our Lent teaching series based on her book, Failure, what Jesus said about sin, mistakes, and messing stuff up. You'll be in for a treat. As we go into our time of worship, let's pray. Father God, thank you for who you are. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to us today. Amen. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil I now surrender, you are breaking new ground. So I yield to you and to your careful hand When I trust you I don't need to understand So make me your vessel Make me an offering Make me whatever you want me to be God, I came here with nothing But all you have given me Jesus, bring new wine out of me crushing in the pressing you are making you wine in the soil I now surrender you are breaking new ground you are breaking Make me your vessel, make me 
make me an offering Make me whatever you want me to be God, I came here with nothing But all you have given me Jesus, bring a new wine out of me Jesus, bring a new wine out of me But now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba in your stead. Since you are precious, and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give people in exchange for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. I thank God, whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. I'm delighted today uh, to be kicking off, I think, a, a sermon series that you're going to be going into for the next few weeks uh, based on a book that I've written. So I've written the Archbishop of Canterbury's Lent book for 2023 and uh, its uh, rather lurid title uh, cover is there on the screen. Um, and that book is all about failure. So I'm going to speak a little bit just introducing that whole topic to us now. But shall we pray as we start? Dear God, we thank you that you made us and you love us. As we think about failure, we thank you that you have never failed and that you have our back. Come and be with us now. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I am the new Bishop of Kensington and I am an expert in failure which is a really great way, isn't it, to begin a new ministry. Actually, I think it is a really great way to begin a new ministry because I think looking at failure, far from being something that is frightening and depressing, is actually something that could be, and I hope will be, really encouraging and uplifting and helpful. We tend to be afraid of failure. We tend not to want to fail, and I think that's natural, but we tend not to know what to do when failure happens, when it happens in our lives, and when it happens in our church, and when it happens in our world. We're tempted to downplay it 
and to want to hide it and to cover it up. But I think that families and organizations and the whole of society would actually be healthier if we made friends with failure. Not all failures are the same, of course. Some failures, I realize as I speak about failure, some failures are very damaging and hurtful. And you might have been on the end of some of those kind of failures. And so I want to say very clearly that not all failure is to be encouraged and embraced. Some failure hurts people, and we need to avoid it at all costs. Uh, we need to find ways and systems of preventing the kind of failures that do great damage, especially in the church. But some failures, I think, are to be actively encouraged because it's only when we fail that we learn and we find new ways of doing things. Thomas Edison, you may know this quote, he invented the electric light bulb, and he said this, I have not failed 10,000 times. I have successfully discovered 10,000 ways that do not work. So perhaps failure is the gateway to new learning. So why, as Christians, do I think we need to be positive about failure? Three reasons. The first reason, it reminds us, failure reminds us that God is God and we are not. God is perfect, God is holy, and we are not, at least not this side of heaven. And sometimes I think in the church especially, we have the temptation to forget that. We can be terribly self-sufficient, we can have lots of plans, uh, but when we fail, it reminds us that we can do nothing without God. Just before I was due to take up this post as Bishop of Kensington, I don't know if you have days like this, but I'd had a really, really bad day. I'd messed up a load of things. I'd got a load of things wrong. And I was having one of those, why on earth, God, have you called me to do this? You must have got it wrong days. And I clearly remember, I clearly recall God saying to me, well, perhaps you had better do this role in my own, in my strength rather than yours, uh, because yours isn't great, to be honest. And that was really encouraging. <laughs> that was just what I needed to hear. Lent is a really good time to reflect on our failures as we come before a God who is holy and strong and who looks on us with great love. So that's the first reason we don't need to be afraid of failure, uh, because God is God and we are not. Secondly, failure reminds us of the forgiveness of God. I don't know about you, but sometimes it can seem as though we need to approach Lent as a bit of a test. You know, I'm going to do Lent really, really well. I'm going to give up all sorts of things and I will think holy thoughts and I will be a much better human by the end of it. And by week three, uh, when we've tried to give up alcohol, but we've had a gin and tonic, or we've tried to give up chocolate, and we've had a Mars bar, uh, being perfect, trying to be perfect, can be very, very tiring. But here's the point about Lent. We don't need to be perfect. We don't even need to be perfect at doing Lent. This isn't a test, but a relationship. So Lent is an opportunity, really, to draw close to God, who loves us and who forgives us and who puts our sins into the deepest sea where he doesn't even remember them. I don't know if you knew that about God. That is such a thing. Did you realize that God is absolutely perfect, but he's also quite forgetful when it comes to our sins and failings? Do you know that once we have confessed our sins to God, which we're encouraged to do, especially in Lent. When we fessed up, God forgets that we even sinned in the first place. That reading we heard from Isaiah 43, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. So if you've ever failed, and if you've confessed that to God, be encouraged. God has taken your failures and has put them in the deepest sea. So don't go and fish them out again. 
A friend of mine went into a school. Uh, she's a clergywoman, and one of the children asked her, uh, what's the worst sin that you have ever committed? And cl- quick as a flash, she said, do you know, I can't remember, and neither can God. So God is God, God forgets our sins, and thirdly, failure reminds us that we're not alone. Failure is a club that we are all part of. So I wonder if you could just now put your hand up if you have never failed at anything at all. Oh, that makes me feel so much better. (laughs) Failure is something that we have in common, and so we can support each other and be there for each other in it. There are some companies, apparently, that have begun to hold failure parties So rather than everybody turning up and telling each other about their great successes, everybody comes with a failure that they have experienced and says what they have learned from it. So everyone can benefit from the learning. Perhaps we need to try this more in church. Imagine what life would look like if we truly allowed others to fail just as we do. I think one of the most neglected gifts in our culture at the moment is patience. We're not a terribly patient society. We expect everything to be done immediately, and when something goes wrong, we demand to know what happened and whose fault it was. Our arguments are rarely nuanced, but shrill and impatient. Patience is the space after failure. So can we be more patient with each other and give each other what the old prayer book calls time for amendment of life? So I fail, you fail, we all fail. So I wonder if we can get better at failing. Can we get better at making better mistakes? So here are very briefly my four top tips for how to be a really successful failure. Number one, learn to live in the mess. When I get stressed, I don't know what you do when you get stressed, but I have a slightly weird thing that really helps me. I tidy things. You know, when my life feels a bit messy, I go to my linen cupboard and I get everything out and I fold everything neatly and I put it back in again. I know, I probably need prayer ministry, I think, for that. But but I need to learn that what I can do with my sheets and my pillowcases, I cannot do with the world around me. Much as I would like to, I cannot tidy everything up and make it all orderly. There is something about learning to live with the chaos and the mess of everyday life that is much needed, I think, in our current times. So much of what we once took for granted is in flux. And those who can live happily in chaos will be less frustrated than those who expect everything to be neat and orderly all the time. I wonder if our mental health would improve uh, if we admitted that life has its ups and its downs, and life is not always an Instagram photoshopped marvel. Perhaps we need to hear that message more. Just because this part of life is a struggle, it doesn't mean your whole life is a failure. Genesis 1, when God created everything that there is, was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, and a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. And all of those words in Hebrew would have been kind of shorthand for chaos. Before God created the world, there was chaos. But this was before sin. So even when things were were good and in God's hand, there was a degree of chaos. So perhaps God brings order and creation out of chaos, but chaos is not a bad thing in itself. So learn to live in the mess. Number two, feel the fear and do it anyway. That's the title of a book from the 1980s that encouraged people to embrace what they found fearful, but to move forward into what they wanted to do. It's natural to want to avoid the shame and the embarrassment of failure, but sometimes we need to take risks. 
Sometimes just getting in, out of bed in the morning can feel like a bit of a risk. But I wonder if as the church, particularly our fear of failure, sometimes stops us from trying new and exciting things. We want to stay with what is safe and predictable. Research uh, into failure shows that organizations who don't immediately ask when things go wrong, who is to blame and how should they be punished, but instead ask what has happened and how do we learn from it? Take the fear factor out of failure and people are more likely to grow and try new things as a result. That reading that we heard from 2 Timothy reminds us that God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. So I wonder if a good question to ask as individuals and as a church is what would we do if we were not afraid? What would we do if we were not afraid? So live in the mess, feel the fear and do it anyway. And thirdly, see the funny side. Life is actually absolutely hilarious. I don't know if you've noticed, it can be quite funny. In the midst of COVID lockdown, I made a little video. I asked people to send me all the outtakes of the times when they were recording their beautiful online services and things that had gone wrong. If you go on my Facebook profile, you can see the video. Um, so people had just got to the end of their perfectly recorded sermon and the dog walks across the screen or a child cries or you get your words muddled, uh, interruptions of various kinds. And I edited together all of these uh, clips and put them online and it kind of went viral. I mean, I've not, never gone viral in my life, but in a very small, low-key way, lots of people seemed to resonate with it. And I wonder why that was. And I think it was because we were trying so hard and putting out all of our perfect versions of ourselves, but behind those lay a whole load of muddle and mess. And we began to think, oh, well, we're not alone. You know, I'm not alone in getting things wrong. We were all trying to muddle along despite circumstances. Our actual failures uh, can not only be quite funny, but quite reassuring when we let them be seen. There used to be a day, apparently, in the church calendar called the Feast of Fools uh, until it was eventually banned by sensible church people. And on that day, a child would be made into a bishop and fun would be poked at various ecclesiastical rituals uh, and they had a sort of riotous time in church. I think there is an important role for fools in the church, those who speak the truth of God but do it with humour. And then finally, remember that failure, whilst very much part of our lives, is never final. I don't know how many of you watch the program, The Repair Shop. Have you, do you see that program? It's a wonderful program where people bring to the workshop anything they have that is very precious and has a precious story attached to it, but has been damaged and has failed or has become shabby or in need of repair. And the people explain what it is and why it matters to them. And then a panel of experts takes it away and repairs it painstakingly and lovingly, sewing up frayed seams and painting over chipped paintwork, fixing broken mechanism. And at the end of the program, the owners come back and there's this kind of reveal moment when this broken but precious thing is uh, shown made new uh, and shiny and beautiful. And there are many tears, usually uh, by the people watching. So what if God deals with us in the same way? We're messed up. We've, we've failed. We are broken. We've got things wrong. We've damaged ourselves and others. But God's promise is to take all of that and slowly and lovingly and painstakingly to make it new again. Not to throw it out with the rubbish, but to restore it in love. So when you're feeling very low about your failures, remember that you are not alone, that God loves you and gives you a spirit of power and strength and self-discipline, not fear. And that God is in the business of making things new. 
And when you're feeling very down about your failures, remember the Benedictine monk who found that due to cold, damp weather, his carefully stored wine had began to ferment a second time, creating with it, within it bubbles of carbon dioxide. Can you imagine when he found that out, all of this wine he'd stored, what a failure that must have been. But the name of the monk? Dom Perignon. So cheers, you lovely failures. God bless you. Let's pray together. Dear God, we thank you that you make us, that you have made us beautiful. We thank you that you have redeemed us in Jesus. And we thank you that you know us, you know our successes and you know our failures. Help us to hear your words of love to us today, that failure is not final and that you are in the business of making things new. Help us as individuals, help us as a church, help us as a society to get better at failing, to fail safely and creatively. And thank you that we can uh, be together in this, that we share this in common and that we are loved by you. In the name of Jesus, amen. People come together, strangers they generations of every nation of kingdom come don't let your heart be troubled hold your head up high don't feel evil fix your eyes on this one true God is madly in love with Take courage, hold on, be strong Remember where our hell comes from You say, oh, 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 your heart be trouble hold your head up I don't fear no evil fix your eyes on this one too God is madly in love with you so take courage hold on be strong remember where our help comes from
wondering why Oh, you heaven Let the praise go up As the walls come down Oh, creation Everything we repeat the song All His children Clean as pure hearts Good grace, good God His name is Jesus Sing why Sing why Oh, you heavens Let the praise go up As the walls come down Oh, creation Thank you so much for being with us today. If you've been inspired by any of our online talks, please do get in touch as we would love to hear from you. Let's pray as we head into a new week. Father God, thank you for being with us. I ask you to fill us with stillness in our hearts. Help us to walk in peace by focusing on Jesus. Thank you for your love and forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great week. Thank you.